Uh, I have a speech. It's a very nice speech. I'm not going to give you any of it. I live in a country where you know things happen. It's you know they always tell you it's never a dull time to be talking about Israel. But you know, boy, is this not a dull time to be talking about Israel. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of try and give you a briefing and an overview of some of the challenges that we're facing, including some of the very current uh, challenges that we're facing, and hopefully thereby giving you a little bit more verbal ammunition uh, to be advocates for Israel, to understand the importance of advocacy for Israel, and by extension to uh, um, have some sense of understanding of why the data project is so important. I think people are spectacularly ignorant about Israel and its challenges. In many cases, people have the most passionate opinions based on very, very limited information or even misinformation. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, but I think that the campaign of delegitimization against Israel is, is a strategic uh, threat to Israel, and therefore people have to be informed, and they have to be confident about their information, and they have to have their information. I thought I'd start this you know, um, non-prepared speech by talking a little bit about myself very briefly, because I think probably some of you will identify with parts of my story, and therefore maybe identify a little bit more with, with why I think Israel is miraculous and wonderful and deserves our, our passion and our investment. Uh, my family is a very um, orthodox rabbinical family going back through the centuries. If any of you have been, just give me a show of hands, actually, you do a little bit of work tonight, not very much. You, if you've ever been to Israel, just raise your hands there. Yeah, I should have asked that the other way around, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, uh, anyone been there in the last two, three months, by the way? Good. If anyone's been there since yesterday, I'll sit down and, 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 and give the talk, because you know, things have changed since yesterday. So if you've been to Israel, there's a little cemetery outside Tiberias where the Rambam, where my Maimonides is buried. There are about four um, graves or five graves in that cemetery. One of them is a Rabbi Yishai Ishorovitz, who was a 16th century um, Prague or uh, sage who wrote a book called Shnei Lachot Brit, The Two Tablets of Stone, and became known by the acronym for that book, the Shin Lamad and the Hei Lishla. And he's a, an ancient, well, 400 year uh, ancestor of mine. That gave me always a very strong sense of connection to Israel. My family was a rabbinical family. They were in uh, Germany uh, for, the, for the generations before World War II. My great grandfather um, founded a synagogue at the Bernerplatz in Frankfurt. Um, my grandfather, who was a lawyer, not a rabbi, fought for Germany in World War I. Um, a great uncle of mine uh, died in the trenches in World War I, fighting for Germany, and had sent letters back to the, from the front um, telling his family, at least I know I'm fighting on the side of good against evil. Um, in 1937, it finally registered with my grandfather that his beloved Germany, who was at once very orthodox and very German, that his beloved Germany was not going to cast out the Nazis. And they fled in some style, it should be said. It wasn't, they weren't penniless, and they didn't, you know, but 37 left it pretty late and fled to England and started a new life in England. Now, some of my, my father was one of ten, and some of the older uh, siblings were interned when the war started as enemy aliens. They'd come from Germany, after all, and now Britain was at war with Germany. My father was young enough not to be interned, but old enough to volunteer by the end of the war, and he did some reconnaissance photography for the, Israel, for the uh, British, the Royal Air Force. And therefore, in the space of one generation, my family went from you know, fighting for Germany, and in fact dying for Germany, to, to and my grandfather's uh, generation to my father actually fighting with the Allies to defeat Germany. When you, when you grow up with that kind of family background, it's great living in Britain, but hey, we've got a country of our own now. We, we happen to be living in a near miraculous period when the Jewish nation has had its you know, sovereignty, uh, um, it's regained its sovereignty. Add that to the fact that it rains every day in London, and that uh, you know, it's somewhat anti-Semitic, and the Jewish community is kind of terrified to raise its head above the parapet, and Jerusalem begins to look you know, pretty compelling. So for me, it was very easy to move to, uh, to Israel. I happened to go to Hebrew University. There was this gorgeous red-haired woman in the political science class who understood the Hebrew much better than I did, and that was you know, 28 or so years and three children ago. My wife incidentally is from Texas, which is how I speak your language, so it's all, you know, it's all worked out very well. So that's, you know, that's what kind of uh, drew me to Israel. But the, 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 the little point that I want to stress there, the, the remarkable fact that in our lifetimes, the Jewish nation got its country back. You know, most of, you know, we've been, we've been in exile for centuries. We got our country back. We have a place on earth where the Jews, as best as a small, embattled country can, can determine their own fate. 
and we need to you know, we need to hang on to it. We need to appreciate how extraordinary it is that we have it, and we need to hang on to it. So the Israel of that that I'm talking about is, I don't know if we, if we, if we should say that it's at war today, but it's certainly at mini-war uh, today. And that's you know, happened really in, in, in the day and a half that I've been, been out of Israel. You know, I woke up yesterday morning, or I resurfaced yesterday morning in New York, and, uh, and we were at war. I want to give you, because I think a lot of the, the, the points that the David Project is, is trying to convey to people is how important context is. And I think we're in the midst, or we're at the beginning, actually, of, uh, of an operation where context is going to be critical. We've been in similar circumstances. Israel um, tried to quash Hamas's capacity to harm our civilians four years ago. We were increasingly widely denounced for what we were doing four years ago. We're at the beginning of a potentially um, similar um, process now, and therefore the context is really important. And probably the most important context when it comes to Israel and Gaza is to stress that we have no quarrel with Gaza. Israel has no physical presence in Gaza whatsoever. We have no military uh, deployment in Gaza. We have no civilian presence in Gaza. The last Israeli who I know who was in Gaza was Gilad Shalit, who was captured um, inside Israel and dragged into Gaza and held hostage for five years until a very lopsided exchange um, securities released in exchange for you know, more than a thousand Palestinian security prisoners. So we have no quarrel with Gaza, ostensibly. We're, we're not uh, um, in anybody else's disputed territory, and yet the rockets keep coming. That's the first and most important point that I would make about this ongoing conflict. And then how this particular conflict erupted. I mean, broadly speaking, I would say that you know, there are any number of starting points, and they all essentially go back to the fact that Hamas is avowedly committed to destroying Israel. But if you want the specifics, uh, last week we discovered another shalit style tunnel had been dug under the border. The Israeli, an Israeli patrol found a very, very well-prepared, explosive, um, booby-trapped, significant, serious tunnel that had been dug from Gaza underneath the Israeli border. They came across it. There's stuff, stuff going on on the border all the time. There was a bomb planted at the border a few days earlier, which, in which, uh, uh, which detonated and, and blew off uh, an Israeli soldier's arm. So they stuck on the water, we found this tunnel, we blew up this tunnel, uh, including a, a minor short foray into Gaza to make sure that the tunnel was deactivated. That was sort of phase one. Hamas decided that they wanted to avenge the uh, discovery of this tunnel. They opened fire um, on Shabbat, on an Israeli jeep, not an Israeli tank, and not an Israeli army, an Israeli jeep, not on the Gazan side of the border, not even at the border, but something like 150 yards inside Israel. They fired an anti-tank uh, missile at an Israeli army jeep on a routine um, journey some distance inside Israel. It is astonishing that the four soldiers who were in that jeep were not killed. Four soldiers who could, of course, be any of our kids, to make this very personal. I have three kids. My eldest is in the army at the moment. My second son will go into the army next year, taking their turns defending Israel. So this jeep was, uh, um, was, was blown up. All four soldiers were injured, one of them very, very seriously. Uh, amazingly, they're not all dead. And Israel responded by uh, um, um, uh, staging air assaults at, uh, at certain targets in Gaza, Hamas infrastructure, and so on. This was intolerable for Hamas. And we then had the beginning of, of a rocket rain, um, which, you know, which went on basically at the beginning of this week, something in excess of 160 rockets and uh, mortar shells that were fired into Israel. And Israel gave every impression of uh, you know, kind of shrugging its shoulders and uh, hitting back as effectively as it could at limited targets and hoping that this round of conflict was over, and evidently had decided that this could not go on anymore and began the operation that we're now you know, on day two of. Um, very limited fatalities on the Palestinian side by comparison with four years ago. Operation Cast Leg, when we last tried this on the first day, uh, there were something like 200 Palestinians who were killed, many of them uh, Hamas uh, uh, cadets graduating from a Hamas uh, training college, and we, we got a great deal of international condemnation very early on. In this case, there, there's been a decision, obviously, not to target certain Hamas targets where there would be many Hamas fatalities. Nonetheless, we're not doing it. It's more pinpointed. It's key Hamas officials. It's missile launchers. It's ammunition stores, uh, and so on. I think there are some... Um, precedents here from the northern 
border that are worth understanding as well. I talked about sort of what has unfolded at the border. Uh, in 2000, Israel dismantled um, a security zone, a kind of buffer that we had inside southern Lebanon. It was to protect northern Israel from attacks by terrorists who would come across the border and target Israeli civilians. So we carved out a buffer zone in southern Lebanon. About two dozen soldiers used to get killed there every year, confronting terrorists who uh, would otherwise have been attacking northern Israel. Pressure built in Israel to, to uh, withdraw from the security zone. We came back to the international border in 2000 with assurances from the whole international community, of course, that everything would be tranquil, and the UN was going to be there, and everything was going to be fine, which we didn't take seriously, and which we were uh, right not to take seriously because the border became very problematic. And what happened is that gradually, Israel, because it didn't want to pr provoke new conflict in Lebanon, essentially ceded control over the border to Hezbollah. We began pulling back from the border, and Hezbollah, which is like Hamas in Gaza, an Iranian-funded, inspired, and armed uh, force, uh, it essentially took over the border and was able to make travel across that border at will, culminating in 2006 in a cross-border attack that led to the Second Lebanon War in 2006, and very um, heavy loss of life on both sides. And I think one of the factors playing out in this current conflict is that Israel is not prepared to cede the border uh, to Hamas, and therefore had to blow up that tunnel, uh, cannot have its soldiers blown up inside Israel, and so on. Obviously, the tunnel, I didn't stress this, but obviously this would be aim would have been, again, to attack an Israeli position inside Israel, kill soldiers, kidnap soldiers, and, and so on. So I think you know, that's, that's some of the context that's playing out here. I suspect that very little of that context will be widely reported and widely understood, which is why I, I want to give you some of that framework. I don't know how this, is, how this conflict is going to play out. You know, there, there are uh, reports tonight that Israel has been gathering ground forces. I don't know if we're going to send ground forces into Gaza. I can tell you, Israel does not want to retake Gaza. We don't want to um, retake responsibility for one to one and a half million Palestinians who are incredibly hostile to Israel. Uh, we would like Gaza to be, you know, we would have liked Gaza to be the exemplar of, of a different uh, Palestinian entity. And by the way, if the Palestinians could have controlled their hatred for us just a little bit after we pulled out of Gaza in 2005, they might have tricked us into pulling out of the West Bank as well. You know, if Gaza had apparently flourished as some kind of uh, democracy. By the way, the beach at Gaza is very scenic. You could actually build a tourism industry in Gaza. You could build a, an econo a thriving economy in Gaza. And we might have been fooled in Israel. So desperate are we to relinquish control over as many of the Palestinians as we can because we want to keep a Jewish democratic Israel that's separated from the Palestinians. Uh, they, they might have encouraged Israel to, to do what we did in Gaza and pull back from most of the West Bank as well. But they couldn't restrain their hostility to us. And after we left, they smashed the greenhouses that had been left behind by the settlers who we pulled out. And the rocket fire has never stopped. Those are you know, some, some of the contextual factors that are important to bear in mind with Gaza. I don't know how this is going to play out. Like I say, I don't think we want to oust Hamas from Gaza. Uh, I'm not sure what can be achieved by a ground operation. But plainly, the evidence of the last day and a half underlines how serious the threat has become. Hamas's desire, really, to pose a strategic military threat to Israel. Today, a day after we took out most of their medium medium-range missile launchers, they were able to fire missiles that hit the Tel Aviv area. It hasn't happened before. Right? There were two, I, don't, I assume most of you heard this in the course of today, there were two missiles that landed in the Tel Aviv area. We had three fatalities in Israel in Kiran Malachi earlier today. Mi rockets and missiles now coming as far as Tel Aviv. We have the most sophisticated missile defense system in the world, which we've built in partnership with the United States. This Iron Dome system that was you know, almost unproven just months ago has been taking out rocket after rocket after rocket, dozens of rockets. Otherwise, the Israeli fatality toll would be, well, frankly, you know, utter, utterly horrifying. Because they, don't, they only fire the Iron Dome when a missile is heading towards residential areas. There have been in excess of 300 rockets fired at Israel in the last two days. And from what I can judge, I the Iron Dome system has taken down dozens, which means dozens of pretty serious rockets were heading towards Israeli residential areas. That brings me to, to, to another of the key contextual points. Uh, the notion that if the balance of death on the Israeli Gaza or Israeli-Palestinian side is very skewed 
and there are many more Palestinians there, well, that must mean that Israel has overreacted, that Israel is the aggressor, that Israel is the Goliath. And that's usually the prism through which people make their calculations. I have a friend who works for the, for the BBC, and I remember talking to her at the time of Castlev four years ago, and she was talking about, you know, the numbers, they, the numbers, a thousand Palestinians, and only 13 Israelis have been killed. You know, as if only a few hundred Israelis have been killed as well, you know, you would have got really good international press. And that, that's, you know, that sounds cynical. That really is a, a, a key parameter through which things are judged. <clears throat> One of the reasons why lots and lots of Israelis have not been killed in the last two days is because of the incredible efforts that we make to keep our people safe. So we have this sophisticated missile system, we have alarm systems, and we have safe rooms, and we've protected an ever-widening band of schools ever further from the Gaza border as the rocket range of, of Hamas has, uh, has expanded. Just you know, on a little personal anecdotal level, that, uh, that eldest son of mine who's now in the army used to play soccer for a Jerusalem soccer team, and they played in Sterot um, in his, you know, two, two or three years ago, and I went to watch them play in Sterot, and I'm sure many of you have seen this. Sterot, which by the way we talk about on the perimeter of Israel as though it's, you know, a long air journey away, one hour and 15 minutes from Jerusalem. Sterot has this soccer field, and on either end of the soccer field in Sterot, there's a little concrete cube. Why? Because if you're out in the soccer field, you might actually not have too much time to take refuge if the rocket alarm sounds. And therefore, either end of the soccer field are the, you know, the concrete cubes, and you've got maybe 15, 30 seconds after the alarms ring to, you know, to, to, to race away to, uh, to, to safety. <clears throat> so, you know, the numbers, the numbers can be tremendously misleading. We are trying to keep our people out of harm's way, and we are facing an enemy that is most deliberately putting its people in harm's way. Harm's way. They, they fire from the courtyards of mosques, they fire from next to schools, they keep ammunition in the ground floor of apartment buildings. A few years ago, I interviewed um, the man who, at the moment, I think is the president or the chairman of Al Al, who used to be the, the head of the Israeli Air Force. And a, man, a gentleman named Eliezer Shkedi. And he was the first person to tell me, you know, David, when the rocket crews go out to fire, sometimes they take kids with them. And I had no idea what he was talking about. He explained to me, when the Qassam and other more sophisticated rockets these days, when those guys go out to fire their rockets into Israel, they take children with them because they think that that way they'll be immune from Israeli attack. The Israelis, because we're fighting, you know, trying to, to maintain a moral war as we protect our people, you know, we would never attack a rocket crew if there was a little kid standing nearby. So I was, you know, surprised by this. I hadn't heard that. And I said, what I thought was quite a natural question. I said to him, so do we fire on them anyway? Have we decided that they, you know, they essentially become combatants, these kids, have been brought into a combat zone? And he was really offended by the question. He said, of course not. Of course we wouldn't fire on, you know, on a, on a rocket crew when there's a kid who would likely be uh, killed if we did so. He said, no, we wouldn't find But of course, what we've done is we've improved our accuracy. And therefore, if a few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to fire if there was a kid within 10 meters of the rocket crew, well, now we're down to five meters. Those are not the exact figures, but you get the idea. <clears throat> now, I'm not trying to steer you on this. I think it's a very, I think you can feel, wow, that Jewish state of ours, it's fantastic. You know, they're at the risk of, to their own people, they wouldn't open fire on, on a, a gang that is about to fire a rocket at, you know, at a, at a civilian area. And I think you can make a very fine moral argument that it is um, imperative to fire on a rocket crew that has taken a kid uh, into, the, uh, into the zone because they're about to fire deliberately into your residential areas. That's not the point. The point is, again, to underline, we are doing our best to keep our own people out of harm's way. We're doing our best to keep their people out of harm's way. And they are trying to put their people very definitely in harm's way. And it shouldn't be too much of a stretch for people to realize this. This is Hamas that runs Gaza. These guys, they're pretty ruthless. They took control of Gaza by killing many, many of their own people. So why would they have any hesitation about putting those people in harm's way? Uh, as they seek to, to, uh, to hurt Israelis. If we are talking with people who are firing deliberately at Israeli civilians, crowing and gloating when they kill and name us, and crying foul to the international community when we inadvertently harm the people who they have placed in harm's way. And those are, I think, some, some pretty important contextual points that, are, that I want to make. Okay, I launched into, obviously, the, you know, the, the hot subject of the hour, and it's, it's the nature of, uh, of, 
of talks like this that we always you know, rush straight in when we start talking about the challenges facing Israel. I'm going to come back and talk about some of the other challenges as well, don't worry, in case you thought I was going to be you know, completely upbeat for, uh, for the rest of the evening. But before I plunge you back down again, I think it's very important to, to remember some positives. Okay? We're all concerned about Israel, that's why you're here. We're concerned that people have a, an honest sense of Israel, that's why you're here. Uh, particularly for something associated with the David Project, people want to be associated with a success story. And I don't want you to lose sight amid all the challenges, first of all, of how diverse and thriving Israel is, and some of the positives. So first of all, just to stress the thriving nature, I'm talking about an unfolding mini-war here. I can also tell you the Alin bicycle ride, which is raising money for an Israeli hospital, you know, that went ahead today in Jerusalem. I can tell you that in Tel Aviv this week. They have Fashion Week, and it was a very successful, it was the second annual Fashion Week. My daughter in Jerusalem just signed up for a, a, a neighborhood um, production of the play Hairspray. These are, you know, little uh, personal anecdotal things. Life goes on, okay? We're living, we're, you know, we're, we're doing fine in the most ridiculous, frequently surreal circumstances. <clears throat> More broadly speaking, you know, let's, let's not lose track of the basic positives. First thing is that we reclaim, it's called the promised land, right? spectacularly unpromising, not much more than a century. You can live in most of what is today. Israel was malaria-ridden. You could not physically survive there. You should read, if you're interested, um, Herman Melville, you know, Moby Dick, comes to, comes to pre-state Palestine, basically goes insane. It was like so awful. I think he wrote 19,000 pages of verse, never wrote another book. His wife said it destroyed their marriage. You know, that's, what, that's what it was like out there uh, before we reclaimed. We reclaimed the land and we reclaimed the language, which is you know, unprecedented. The language that has become the language of prayer and we dragged it, we dragged it into the modern era. And it's an astonishing thing. You have this academy of, um, of experts who are basically retooling ancient Hebrew for the needs of uh, um, you know, the, mod the modern Israel. He was a very, very difficult language, as some of you probably know. You know, those of you who didn't grow up, didn't grow up saying things like ch and s, you know, there are all these crazy sounds in there, but it's a very logical language, and, and lots of the verbs are built on three-letter roots, and you can tailor it, and you can tailor uh, new words with, you know, sort of logical precision. And that's what we're doing, and it's wonderful to see uh, um, Hebrew meeting the needs of, of first world Israel. Uh, and, and good Hebrew speakers in the room? Here's my test question for you. How do you say accountability in Hebrew? Okay, anyone? There is none. Yeah, it's a trick question. There's no, there is no Hebrew word for accountability. Which, which is a lacuna that is, is reflected in our politics. Uh, what's, what's the best you can do? Okay, responsibility. We have a word for responsibility, and what we've done is we've said responsibility ness. So we've kind of added you know, the ness on there, but we don't have uh, we don't have that word. But apart from that, you know, we're doing pretty well. So we've revived the land, we've revived the language, we've transitioned. I mean, you don't even notice this, but the people of you know my age and older in the room, this used to be the country of Jack Oranges, and now it's the country of you know startups and high tech, and nobody kind of noticed that switch. And it's an amazing thing. I mean, people have been left behind. We have social economic issues. I'm not glossing over them. But broadly speaking, our, our economy has struck, stripped, strike, strode, strode, strode forward, even when the factories that are producing the high tech uh, um, products are under attack. In northern Israel was under attack in 2006. You know, the, the economy didn't even, it didn't even blip. And foreign companies, notably American led companies, actually deepened their investments in Israel. The economic um, thriving of high-tech Israel has, has its roots in at least two very relevant and resonant Israeli factors. The first of which is immigration. And we took in in Israel basically one-seventh of our own number again in the space of, most of it in the space of three years around the end of the 80s when the Soviet Union collapsed. <clears throat> it's the equivalent, really, of America bringing you know, 40 million people in. And you used to hear those stories about the Russians very unhappy in Israel. It's awful. We're going to go back, and then you stopped hearing those stories. And we at all, one, one in eight of our own number, and this was an, a group of immigrants who all seemed to be you know, computer whiz kids or you know, engineers of, of incredible skill, and they are a huge driver of the Israeli high-tech industry. The second big driver is the army. I mean, there are other factors as well, but the army is a big factor. If you've if you yourselves are 18, 19, 20, or have kids that age, or grandkids that age, they'd be in the army now. 
And the army puts incredibly high responsibility on very young shoulders. So 18, 19, 20, you're dealing with life and death stuff right now. You know, there are people who are, who are grappling with that at a very young age, improvising, innovating, thinking on their feet with huge consequences. What happens after that when they come out of the army, three years for boys, two years for girls, they tend to go off and decompress in the most exotic, <coughs> ridiculous places on earth that they can find. It used to be Goa, then it became Thailand, I think Bolivia is very in of late. Then they come back and they go to university and they're more serious about university because they're a little bit older. And then if they go into high tech, you know, with that kind of background, first of all, you're not too scared of failure. Okay, so you try again. You're not too hidebound by sort of conventional wisdom or peer pressure, and you push the envelope. And that's been a huge factor in, in our high tech, which has kept the Israeli economy fairly robust, even in a, in a time of sort of global crisis. So that's you know, uh, um, something to be incredibly uh, proud of where Israel's concerned. Another factor that we seem to do spectacularly well is we turn out you know, really bright people, despite the fact that when I think of my kids, they didn't seem to have been in school an awful lot. You know, they were always home by early in the afternoon. There were plenty of days and weeks in the year when they never went at all. And somehow they've come out you know, pretty self-sufficient, but also you know, pretty well-educated. And this is a country, you know, we don't invest enough in education, but we seem to produce this, this pretty smart uh, generation of people. We have won in Israel, by the way, 10 Nobel Prizes in our short history, which is ridiculously disproportionate, including three for chemistry in the last eight years, which is unbelievable. And when they announce the Nobels and it isn't an Israeli, we kind of get a little bit upset about that <laughs> and assume that it's anti-Semitism, but then, <laughs> then it turns out that the winners are Jewish, just not Israeli, and then <laughs> and, and we try and work out how much time they've spent in Israel and you know, whether, whether they were at the Technion, which is how they got smart in the first place, which makes us feel a little bit bad. And that's you know, pretty much the case. If you look at some of this year's winners, you'll know, you'll know what I'm talking about. We want to be a light unto the nation. And a lot of the nations in the region have not wanted to see the light, so we've gone further afield. And we, we taught Africa drip irrigation, which is really astonishing, you know, maximizing what you can grow from very limited water. There's an earthquake in Haiti, and we're 16 hours away, and we're the first people there with the most sophisticated medical uh, assistance that anyone manages to bring. And if you ever have the opportunity to speak to that Israeli army team who are basically living with their suitcases packed all the time, ready to go, they're fantastic people. So a lot to be you know, very, very aware, and, and many more things as well, I could say, uh, about the positives and about how successful this country is, and how thriving it is, even right now, when it's, when it's under assault, when it's under you know, almost unprecedented assault. It's, it's the first time in 20 years we've had rockets falling in Tel Aviv, since Saddam was you know, throwing scouts at Israel tanks during the Gulf War. Yeah, people might bring me water because they think I might speak a little bit slower, it doesn't, doesn't work. <laughs> So, you know, we're under assault, and, and yet we're thriving. So now I want to um, detail for you some of the uh, problematics that we're grappling with. And I think the, the, the most important thing, I mean, there are two building blocks that I would want to impress upon any audience, and I know you know both of them, but that I would think that would be very important for all the work that the David Project is doing for enabling people to understand Israel. The first is to emphasize that this is not 65-year-old, Israel that will be marking this late spring, but the revived Jewish homeland, the third uh, instance of Israel uh, attaining sovereignty. This is the only place on earth where the Jews have wanted to be sovereign. It's the only place where we have ever been sovereign. We've never willingly left, and we've always prayed to return. I would stress that because that underlines, and I'll come back to that, the, the historic legitimacy of Jewish nationhood. The second thing that I think, I think people don't know that, and believe me, Ahmadinejad and Iran and the whole delegitimization program is aimed at you know, having people forget that the Jews have historic legitimacy in, in the Middle East. The second thing I think people don't recognize is that we're really, really, really small. You know, you've got my eyesight and you take a step back from a map of the Middle East and you cannot see Israel anymore. It is nine miles wide at its narrowest point. Okay, if you go up Road 6, which is the toll road up the eastern spine of Israel, there are places where it runs right up against what was the pre-67 Jordanian-controlled West Bank. And if you turn left, like somewhere like Tulkaran, which is a big Palestinian city on the western edge of the West Bank, if at that point, on the eastern edge of Israel, you turn left and you go across the width of Israel towards Netanya, it is literally a 15-minute drive. 
even if you, you know, obey all the traffic laws and uh, stop all the traffic lights, it's a very short journey. That's the whole width of Israel. Drive like an Israeli, which we do not recommend, and it's you know, eight hours top to bottom. Like I said, Stirol, people talk about Stirol on the Gaza border. You think it's miles and miles away, you know, days in the car. It's an hour and 15 minutes from Jerusalem. I think, I think people are unaware of that. Now, when you're a country that small, A, you want normalized relations with the neighbors, you can have no room for maneuver, of course you want tranquility with the neighbors, <clears throat> but B, you also can't do lousy deals with neighbors who are not interested genuinely in maintaining peaceful relations with you. So that size factor is incredibly important in understanding Israel. Now, I would say I come from somewhere in the confused middle ground of Israeli politics. Uh, I would say it's very fair to argue that when Israel has had a realistic opportunity to make peace, we seized it. When Sadat came in 77 and said, let's put an end to the war between us, we made peace with Egypt. When King Hussein of Jordan met for the first time with Israel's Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, we signed the peace treaty 100 days later. Complicated accord, remarcating the border, water reallocation, destroyed a central plank of Israeli right-wing ideology which had hoped that kind of Jordan would become Palestine and yet was broadly endorsed in the Israeli parliament and among Israelis. We haven't been able to make peace with the Palestinians and with the Syrians because it's incredibly complicated and we've not felt that there was, that the, that the factors were there. And, and what the, the current reality in the Middle East has done is it has co massively complicated our dilemmas. We used to ask ourselves sort of two questions and now we ask ourselves a third. We used to ask ourselves, are we prepared to relinquish the territory? And we're told, if we give it up, we'll, we'll give us peace. That's a big ask. Because first of all, we didn't control the territory that we're told, if you relinquish it, you'll have peace, from 1948 to 1967, and we did not have peace. We didn't control the old city of Jerusalem, we didn't control the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, the Gaza Strip, they were not in Israeli hands, and we were facing existential warfare. So, there's a security dimension, there's a religious and historic dimension. The Jewish narrative does not play out in Tel Aviv in the Bible. It plays out in Hebron and Bethlehem and Shiloh and places that are beyond the sovereign borders of modern Israel. So we feel that we have a claim to the historic Judean scenario. And there are the security dilemmas. So that was question one. Are we prepared to relinquish the territory? Question two, is there someone willing to meet us halfway? Now, I would say, when Sadat came, or when Hussein came, yeah, we were prepared to relinquish the territory. We thought there was someone willing to meet us halfway. The third question that we now have to ask ourselves in the Middle East of 2011, 2012, is if we're prepared to relinquish the territory, and if we even think that maybe the guy on the other side is willing to meet us halfway, is he still going to be there, right? Tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, to honor any accord that we may make with him. And the most obvious example of that is Syria. Now, if I'd been speaking to you three years ago and I was briefing you on sort of Israeli um, mindsets, I would tell you the head of the, of the army and the security service, they were urging the politicians, try and make peace with Assad. Yeah, we know he's not particularly popular, and we know he's not democratically elected. Yeah, they had elections in Syria every seven years, but just the one candidate, right? We knew all that. We knew all that, but the prize of making peace with Syria, isolating Iran. It was a very attractive um, equation for, for Israel because Iran is the key strategic threat. I'll talk about that in a second. So there were you know, this effort to, to, to build overtures, to build some kind of relationship with Assad. The price of peace with Syria? It's the Golan Heights. You know, I'm, not telling, I'm not sure where the line would go, but the high ground from which you look down across northern Israel, and you're an hour from Damascus, from where we were attacked from 1948 to 67, the high ground. That's the price of peace with Syria. And like I say, the very, very serious, credible heads of Israel's security hierarchies were urging the politicians two, three years ago, see if we can make some progress with Assad. We need to isolate Iran. Now, I'm telling you that in November 2012, and it sounds ridiculous. It sounds absurd. Well, Israel could give up the Golan Heights to Syria, to Bashar Assad, who's massacring his people, 30,000 people in the last year and a half, and more. Most importantly, Bashar Assad could be gone by the time we leave the sea. Who could disappear at any moment? Or we'd have done a deal with a guy who's ousted five minutes later. So our reality became even more complicated. This tiny country, distinctly embattled in a region that is utterly unpredictable. 
And that's the truth. The truth is the region is utterly unpredictable, and anybody who thinks that they can tell you how it's going to unfold, I defer to them, I have no idea how things are going to unfold. We didn't expect that people would take to the streets in Syria to challenge Assad. They knew they'd be placing, you know, they'd be risking their lives. His father had massacred, you know, 20,000 of them. But they did. We don't know. We don't know how things are going to unfold. Jordan starting to look a little bit less solid in the last few days. There have been demonstrations. The king is quite openly criticized now. That wasn't the case uh, very long ago. Egypt. One of the reasons why Hamas thought it could get away with, you know, irritating Israel with rocket attacks was this belief that we wouldn't dare hit back because Egypt is no longer dependably going to stay out of any confrontation that we might have with Hamas. And the Egyptian Prime Minister is meant to go and visit Gaza tomorrow. I'm not sure how any of this is going to play out. <clears throat> but Egypt is you know, very complicated now. We were so calm about Egypt, we hadn't even fenced off the border with Egypt. We started fencing it off because we thought we were going to be hit, and we were beginning to be hit, with an influx of economic migrants from Africa. So we started fencing off the border, and then, of course, anarchy developed in the Sinai Peninsula. It's very fortunate that we fenced off the border. You know, the relationship with Egypt is incredibly sensitive, unpredictable. There are worse people who could have become president of Egypt, I think, than Mohammed Morsi. But he does come from the Muslim Brotherhood. And if you want a little insight into Morsi, you know, it's, the, it's the, the tale of his letters to Shimon Peres. And Shimon Peres sends him a couple of nice letters. He writes back a very nice letter to Shimon Peres. If you see it, and we, we had it on our website, uh, it looks like it was banged down in the corner of his office on an old sort of IBM Golf typewriter, which I really had visions of him doing, because nobody else would write a nice letter to the Israelis on behalf of the Egyptian president. So he sends this letter, and there's an outcry in Egypt. How could you write a nice letter to the terrible Israelis? And his office denies that he sent the letter that we have, that we can all see. Okay, so he denies it. Then he does something very positive. He appoints an ambassador. He changes the status quo. There had been no Egyptian ambassador. He's now been recalled, by the way, because of the current com conflict. But he appoints an ambassador. The ambassador comes to see President Perez and delivers a letter. That's what you do. That's diplomatic protocol. Here's the letter from my head of state introducing me. And it says, my great and good friend, which is not remarkable for diplomatic language. And then it's a pretty normal diplomatic letter. And we are, are reports took a photograph of that as well. The, the English version and the Arabic version. And the head of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt says, no, that's not true either. There was no letter. It's a Zionist fabrication. And there's then a 24-hour pause. And you can hear, you can hear across the desert, you can hear Morsi thinking, how am I going to get out of this one? Right? Everyone's seen this letter. I mean, I can't deny this letter. So the next day, it took them 24 hours to confirm, in fact, he had written that letter, but you know, don't read too much into it. I mean, that gives you just a tiny insight into some of the sensitivities that we're grappling On the Palestinian front, you know, the, the key Palestinian problem that we're grappling with right now is that you know, there are relative moderates in the West Bank, and there's Hamas that has taken over Gaza, and if we were not deployed in the West Bank, Hamas would take over the West Bank as well, and rocket fire from the West Bank paralyzes all of Israel. So it's a very complicated uh, dilemmas that we face with the Palestinians. Mahmoud Abbas can sound very conciliatory, and then he can go to the UN and make a speech that was even nastier than Ahmadinejad's speech this year, which is really, you know, which is really going somewhere. We have an interest in finding an accommodation with the Palestinians. We want to keep Israel at once Jewish and democratic. That means we're prepared to forego our claim to much of the disputed territory. But we do need a partner who's going to be there, who's going to meet us halfway, and, like I said, who's not going to disappear a day, or a week, or a year after we sign an agreement with them. Which brings me to the key challenge that we're facing, which is the challenge that, that is posed by Iran, which is arming Hezbollah to the north, which is arming and equipping Hamas to the south, and which is closing in on a nuclear weapon. And which might use it, if they go. We don't, we don't know what their definition of rationality and pragmatism is, if they believe, as they purport to believe, that this world is some glorious antechamber for a world to come, for a glorious Islamic dawn, that the finest thing you can do for your God is kill Jews, Christians, and non-believing Muslims, then they'll use the bomb if they get it. Even if they don't, they remake the whole balance of power in the region. What does that do to Israel economically? Living in the shadow of an Iranian bomb, what does it do to Israel psychologically? What does it do to people visiting Israel? If you listen to Israel's leaders, we cannot be reconciled to a nuclear Iran. 
That's the, that's the message that comes out of Israel. And that's where things become complicated between us and the United States. And it's not, I think, too much is made of, of red herring issues. The, the fact is that between Israel and the United States, there's never been the kind of coordination that there has been of late on Iran. We are, we are, everybody is openly exchanging information. The presidents and the prime ministers and the chiefs of staff and the defense chiefs and the, um, the security chiefs, the intelligence chiefs, all going from Israel to the United States, almost all the same people coming back in the other direction. Very, very open coordination, very similar assessments about Iran and the danger that Iran poses and where Iran is on its, uh, on its nuclear path. So why the friction and the difficulties? Well, first of all, we're a lot nearer to Iran than you are. We're a lot more immediately threatened by Iran than you are, although they hate you too. You're the great Satan, we're just the little Satan, right? And also because there's much less damage and militarily that we can do to Iran than you can. And if you look at those three factors, they explain why there is difficulties and, and tensions in the American-Israeli um, assessment or partnerships or relationship where Iran is concerned. We're closer, we're more threatened, and we have less time and less capacity to stop Iran. Now, I'm going to tell you something very speculative, which I have no means of, uh, of proving. I think that Netanyahu wanted to strike at Iran this past summer. I think when you're the Prime Minister of Israel and you're responsible, you're responsible for the well-being of the Jewish nation with, with its history, it, it, it gives you a sense of destiny and fate. I think he feels that he was destined to be Prime Minister. He feels that his father, who he eulogized earlier this year, saw the Holocaust coming and was powerless to avert the tragedy, and now here is, is Netanyahu running an Israel that can defend itself. And I think he, he talks about the Iranian threat in, in parallel terms, or he invokes the Nazi era when he talks about the Iranian threat, and I think he wants to strike. And he was essentially overwhelmed by an accumulation of opposition from Israel's defense chiefs, from the president of Israel, from the American government, from the American defense chiefs, and so on. There was too much opposition, and he didn't do it. But we're now in a situation where it's, it's not for much longer that Israel can credibly believe that we can stop Iran. There are all sorts of things that we do that are not the obvious options, I imagine, but none of which you know, we confirm, but there are things that may have, assume have been done to slow the Iranians. But our capacity to impact the Iranian program is disappearing. And if Israel doesn't strike soon, we will be subcontracting our well-being to somebody else, to our best friends, but to, to somebody else. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that all Israelis think we should be striking Iran. In fact, all Israelis would much rather nobody has to strike Iran. We hope that sanctions might get work. We hope that the Iranians might, you know, be forced out of power. Lots of things that would, that would obviate the need for resort to military force. But if things carry on and we don't use our option, we will have, like I say, subcontracted our existential defense issues to somebody else. And we've never done that before, and we're very, very troubled. And in the light of, I don't want to get partisan on American politics with you, heaven forbid, watching the third presidential debate where you saw both candidates being going to such lengths to be supportive of Israel was not as comforting as you might think it would be because they also went to great lengths to stress to the American electorate their reluctance to resort to military force in any context, but certainly including Iran. And we understand that completely. We don't want to have to use force against anybody either. We don't want to have to fight wars. But if you were watching that debate in Iran, you would not have turned off the television at the end of it feeling terrified. Right? You would have thought, hmm, neither of these people is sounding like they're very deterring. And in Israel, that was discomforting for us. So I think that's some of the perspective in which to, to view Iran. Okay, I want to wrap up now. I want to wrap up with, with just some, some sort of broad brush strokes, which I think are important for understanding Israel. Again, in the context of, of uh, an evening dedicated to, to an organization that wants to educate people effectively about Israel, but wants to show Israel all its diversity, but also wants people to understand the basics about, about Israel. I think you can look at um, our modern history and you can talk about three phases or three strategic approaches that have been employed to try and work this out. The first one was conventional warfare. So we were born, we were revived in 1948 in the midst of a war that was designed to finish us off before we could start breathing. And if we'd lost in 48 or 56 or 67, maybe even in 73, we wouldn't be having this conversation. These were wars designed to wipe us out, and they didn't work. We prevailed. Sometimes, almost miraculously, we prevailed. And in 77, Sadat reluctantly concluded, I can't get rid of these Jews, you know, I'll go and make peace with them. 
And we thought that, well, maybe that's it. Maybe we can now build a circle of normalization. But instead, most of the Arab world stopped speaking to Egypt rather than starting speaking to us. But conventional warfare seemed to be off the agenda. So then uh, most of the enemies changed tactics rather than coming to terms with us, and some of them introduced strategy number two, which is terrorism. And we were subjected in the early years of this millennium to terrorism as a strategic weapon. Uh, just give me a show of hands if you were in Israel in 2000 or 2001 or 2002 or 2003. A lot of you. So you're honorary Israelis because you came to Israel when it wasn't necessarily the smartest thing to do. Well, you know, we were living there, so I'm glad that you came. You know, we'll, we'll still be living there. But you're you know, honorary Israelis. You know, we were raising our kids there. Life in Israel in the early years of this millennium was a grisly lottery. You left home knowing people were trying to kill you. Every day they were trying to kill you. And about once every couple of weeks they managed to blow up a bus or a restaurant or a shopping mall and so on. And it's astonishing to me that Israel thrived and survived the Second Intifada. And I don't think we've internalized how amazing it is. If people are trying to kill us every day, the sensible thing is go and live somewhere else, where they're not trying to kill you every day. And we didn't. And we didn't have great Churchillian leadership rallying the masses. We decided we're not going to give up on this country. We're, we're worried about the well-being of the Jews without a Jewish state. We're not going to be terrorized. We're not going to flee. And we came through it. And I think it's an astonishing thing. And I wouldn't say terrorism is over, but basically it is much reduced. We're now in phase three, and phase three, some of which I've spoken about already, is very relevant to this evening and the sponsors of this evening, because it's a combination of the kind of warfare that we're being dragged into, which makes us look bad, as we try not to hit the people who are trying to hit us, and, and a broader attempt at delegitimization. The effort to argue that we don't have the right to exist, that the Jews uniquely don't have the rights to their national homeland. And Ahmadinejad misrepresents us every year at the UN. He talks about Israel as a uh, a colonial implant unjustly imposed upon the blameless Palestinians by a Europe that felt guilty about the Holocaust, whose dimensions, incidentally, he denies. That is the Ahmadinejad, Ahmadinejad narrative, the Iranian-championed narrative of Israel. And it sounds plausible if you don't know anything about Jewish history. And let's face it, most of us don't know very much about anything. We know about the things that touch our lives. If you're the great masses watching this guy on television, he's telling you a plausible story. And that's a, a very profound effort at delegitimizing us because it cuts us off from our sovereign roots in that part of the world. And Arafat did the same. Arafat told the Palestinians that there's no Jewish, there was no Jewish temple in Jerusalem. By extension, there's no legitimacy for Jewish sovereignty in that part of the world. So that's what we're grappling with now. And that's why it was very important for me to stress some of the sort of historic rootedness. I happen to think that Israel next year, when we go to 65 years, we should put up three zero in front there. So make the point, you know? Yeah, 65 years this time, but we've been here before, um, and we intend to stay around. So that's, you know, like I said, that was uh, a very important point, or, or two or three that I wanted to stress to you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for inviting me to speak to you tonight. Uh, I want to stress again how important it is for me and how pleased I was to speak on behalf of an organization that is trying to tell Israel's narrative. I don't think it's coincidental that the battle that plays out on campus is really an effort to sever connections by which you exchange information. If you can close off academic exchange, if you can close off journalistic exchange, if you can stop people interacting, then you can build false narratives and false stereotypes, and you can demonize and you can delegitimize. So every, everything that is done to give people access to honest information, that's what we tried to do at the Times of Israel online, that's what the David Project is trying to do to people on campus, give them the tools to understand Israel and more effectively advocate for it. So I want to thank you for coming and hearing my round of applause.